I'd like to begin by telling you a bit about the namesake of this lecture series and then about our speaker. At the age of 12, Alice Louise Reynolds entered Brigham Young Academy where she earned a normal diploma in May of 1890 and a Bachelor of Pedagogy degree in 1895. She studied for two years at the University of Michigan and also studied at Chicago, Cornell, Cal Berkeley, Columbia, and then later in London and in Paris to enhance her teaching of English and literature. She received a Bachelor of Arts degree in 1910 after the Brigham Young Academy had become Brigham Young University. Sister Reynolds was later appointed to the faculty of BYU and earned the rank of full professor in 1911. She was the second woman in Utah to attain that status. As a member of BYU's faculty library committee and as its chair for 19 years, Alice Louise was the driving force for the establishment and growth of the BYU library. While serving as chair of the BYU Library Committee, she spearheaded a fundraiser that resulted in the purchase of over 1,200 books for the library collection. And at the conclusion of her remarkable academic career, Professor Reynolds donated her own sizable private library to the BYU Library, significantly improving the quality and depth of the then infant collection. She was active in civic and community affairs and served in many positions in the church, including as editor of the Relief Society magazine for several years. She also served on the General Relief Society board. Latter-day Saint students memorialized her intellectual and spiritual contributions by organizing local Alice Louise Reynolds clubs in order to collectively continue her pattern of lifelong learning. Her life typifies the very best of BYU faculty. This auditorium is named after Professor Reynolds, and for many years the library has honored the memory of Professor Reynolds and her scholarship with this annual lecture. In 2004, we modified the Reynolds Lecture Program to expressly honor outstanding women scholars at BYU. Our intention is to make this lecture series one of the premier acknowledgments of the intellectual contributions of women scholars at BYU. This year's lecturer, Karina Trujillo Tanner, joined the BYU College of Nursing as an assistant professor in 2019 after completing her PhD and a two-year National Institutes of Health Research Fellowship in Cancer, Aging, and End of Life. She holds post-master's certif certificates in gerontology and adult nurse practitioner training and an international certificate in caring and healing science. She maintains an ongoing clinical practice at the University of Utah Moran Eye Center where she has worked since 2011 creating curricula designed to help individuals with vision loss to maintain their independence and quality of life. She's also created curricula to help the blind in the Caribbean as part of a team funded by LDS Charities. She leads the College of Nursing Task Force on Belonging and is a member of the Utah State Planning Council for Alzheimer's Disease and Related Dementias, as well as the federally funded Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program. Her research on blindness and post-traumatic growth is informed by her own experience with blindness. She is passionate about guiding students in honoring and fostering late life potential and creating an age-inclusive and ability-inclusive culture. She is the mother of four children, ages 8 to 28, and is very grateful for the support of her husband, Boyd, in all that she does. They enjoy hiking in the beautiful Wasatch Mountains. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Trujillo Tanner to the podium. Thank you, friends and colleagues, for being here. Uh, what a privilege and what an honor. This library is sacred space to me. I spent many hours here uh, decades ago with a special piece of magnifying equipment that allowed me to read my textbooks. And I came and spent many more hours, not as faculty and not as a BYU student, but just as a regular citizen, because this is the sacred space where I wrote my doctoral dissertation. There is a special spirit here, and a spirit of learning, and a spirit of growth. And I'm so glad to be able to honor Alice Louise Reynolds, because it is thanks to her hard work and her vision that I was able to benefit from this beautiful place. I also have to thank my mom and dad. I, I embarked on this journey many years ago with no college degree as a single mother to, to work at BYU and be a professor at BYU. And as soon as I decided I would start taking classes at our little local community college in rural Colorado, my mom started calling me Dr. Trujillo. <laughs> and I've been Dr. Trujillo Tanner ever since to her. <laughs> so this is a great, a great moment for me. Let's go ahead and dive into the subject. 
I hope that although this is an academic lecture on a theoretical academic framework, that what I'm going to teach you and what I'm going to tell you will be of value to you. That you can use some of these ideas and implement them into your life right now to help and support people around you who are going through difficult challenges and traumatic events. You knew there was going to be a weird photo if it was nurses. So like, <laughs> if you guys are squeamish, sorry, there won't be many more of these. Um, some things optimize under stress. When muscle is torn, when you lift things that are too heavy, and the fibers literally tear and break, and inflammation ensues, the muscle becomes bigger, and it becomes stronger than it was before. Same with bone, vertical vectors of force put pressure on that bone and it becomes not only more dense and more strong, but also more flexible. We see this in nature. Here's a story from my neighborhood. My friend Kim loves chive blossoms. They're so whimsical. They're round and purple. They look like something from a children's book. And she imagined growing these chives and having beautiful purple blossoms. And she babied these little chives. And she kept the soil moist. And she moved it from place to place so it would be in the sun. And it just didn't look like it was going to bear any of these beautiful blossoms. So she talked to her friend who is a naturalist and she said stick it in the dirt and stop watering it it might even help if you step on it <laughs> and that's just right it, it optimized under pressure why are nurses interested in growing under pressure things that grow under pressure and do people grow under pressure Here's our beloved Florence Nightingale. Nursing is an art, and if it is to be made an art, it requires as exclusive a devotion and as hard a preparation as any painter's or sculptor's work. For what is having to do with dead canvas or dead marble compared to the living body, the temple of God's spirit? It is one of the fine arts. I had almost said the finest of the fine arts. Nurses care deeply about their patients. And a modern day nursing theorist, Jean Watson, says, we have as nurses a covenant with humanity. And we don't just care for the body physical. A person is not just a physical body. But we must also care for the mind and the spirit of that person. We are all one, and we may have been born for this very moment that we are with this patient to help and heal them, the whole person, not just the physical body. So nurses have an interest in a psychological construct like post-traumatic growth, a term that describes growth and positive change. Wow, I can even read that. <laughs> Growth and positive change beyond adjustment. So it's not just resilience. Resilience describes bouncing back to baseline. This is growth beyond where you were before the challenge happened. And this accrues not from the trauma, but from the struggle that ensues. The struggle with highly challenging life circumstances. I became interested in post-traumatic growth when I observed something unique happening with my patients uh, up at the hospital, patients who are going blind. One day, I was administering a questionnaire designed to measure quality of life, quality of life of the blind in particular. And it's a slew of questions. How difficult is it for you to cross the street? One to five. How difficult is it for you to prepare food? One to five. How lonely do you feel? Um, and we got to the end of the questionnaire. Based on how you scored, they would decide or they would attribute a, a level of quality of life to you. And I was working with this pleasant older gentleman. We got to the end and he goes, but when are they going to ask me about my quality of life? <laughs> it didn't have anything to do with his 
physical circumstances or his disability, he had rich meaning and satisfaction in his life despite his disability. And I saw this time and time again. Um, although trauma is never desirable, I have even heard people say that they were glad that their blindness happened because the things that they learned had such deep and rich meaning for them. Tedeschi and Calhoun, two psychologists out of University of North Carolina, coined the phrase post-traumatic growth in the mid-90s. In, in the late 80s through the mid-90s, there was this big burgeoning movement of positive psychology. So we went from where we used to document and chart and map all the things that can go wrong in the human mind. Instead, now, there were a lot of researchers worldwide who were wanting to map and chart what goes right. Because if you discover what goes right, you can help foster that and facilitate it in people who may be struggling or stuck somewhere. So during this time, there was all this research, and it was all kind of similarly named adversarial growth stress-related growth, benefit finding. But it was Tedeschi and Calhoun's model um, that was the, emerged as being the preeminent term used. Um, Post-traumatic growth research has uh, taken place in hundreds of locations, hundreds of studies, and post-traumatic growth has been documented in survivors of almost any traumatic experience that you can think of, from uh, natural disasters to car accidents to sexual violence, uh, diseases, cancer, blindness, now blindness with mine, I made that contribution. <laughs> and, um, and so it's just an amazing phenomenon. Let's see, uh, oh, one more thing. Tedeschi and Calhoun actually didn't even start out studying post-traumatic growth. They started out studying wisdom, and when they found people who they thought were wise, they learned that every single one of them had endured very challenging circumstances that had accrued to them their wisdom. Post-traumatic growth is measured in five domains. Relationships with others. So people who experience a trauma and then in that struggle and that experience after the trauma may discover that they have closer relationships than they did before. Or maybe they discover that their family members were there for them in a way that they hadn't anticipated. Or maybe they discover that they can relate to others who have had similar, really difficult circumstances. So we can see positive change in relationships with others. Also, personal strength. Sometimes you find out that you're stronger than you thought you were. And sometimes you go through such a difficult time and come through on the other end to a new reality, less afraid of future challenges and future trauma. So increased personal strength. Spiritual change, spiritual growth, or existential growth. When you go through a very difficult time, it causes you to ask big questions, like, why am I here? Or, is there a God? Does he love me? Um, is the Savior there for me? Sometimes people even experience a visitation from someone on the other side of the veil that wouldn't have happened had the difficult circumstance not occurred. And new possibilities. I definitely see this in the population that I work with, with the blind, because people had engaged in activities and things that they uh, thought that they'd be doing forever, um, but then they become blind and they can't do that thing anymore. But then they find new things that they're interested in and new paths. Um, so new possibilities can come from these challenges. And a greater appreciation for life. I especially have seen this in people who have had a brush with death or who are terminally ill, who just savor every day in a new way and have an increased sense of gratitude. So for fun, because I love stories and my patients and my friends are my best teachers, I'm gonna share a story that highlights uh, each of these areas of growth. And we're going to start with relationships with others. 
And I'm going to tell you about my marvelous friend, Kester Tapaha, who's here. Kester, sorry to put this. <laughs> you know, Kester was raised on the Navajo reservation. This comes with some challenges. One of the challenges that he faced was no water sometimes, or having to go to a river to get water to use. I mean, I have no idea how much water I use at my house, but it's a lot. And so it would, ch it would affect the way that you live, and it would be a challenge. Um, also, Kester experienced from a very young age juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, which was very painful and affected his mobility. And he spent many many months and weeks, much of his childhood, in and out of hospital settings. But it was ex his experience with blindness that happened when he was in his early 40s that Kester told me had the biggest impact on post-traumatic growth or ways that he had grown from his struggles. And I'm going to share uh, some of his words from an interview that we did together, or a conversation, I should say. Kester wisely says, we put labels on people and they become that. Because I can't see, I can't label people. Instead, I meet them for who they truly are. I had a new client. As I met with him, I was impressed by his intelligence, humility, and kindness. He was engaging and highly motivated, and our meeting went very well. And I felt confident and hopeful for him. Um, Kester's a vocational counselor, so he felt very hopeful for this new um, client. I was surprised after he left the office when the receptionist and even my boss said, you're transferring him, right? We can't work with him here. You need to transfer him. When I asked why, they told me that he had prison tattoos and long hair and really dirty shoes. But Kester could see past all of that because of his blindness. The gift my blindness gives me is the ability to know people for who they really are and not what their outside appearance might inaccurately suggest. That's a treasure from the abyss. Personal strength. This is my great friend, Elaine, and she shared her story with me. I might add, each of these stories is shared with permission of the person that I'll be talking about. Um, Elaine was enjoying some newfound freedom after raising a large family, and she'd gone back to school. She just had one child, a teenager, 15-year-old, left at home. She had an adult daughter that was a single mother of a nine-year-old, and the adult daughter was expecting a baby. One afternoon, Elaine received a phone call from the hospital uh, letting her know that her daughter had gone into preterm labor. She rushed to the hospital in time to receive the news that her daughter had died in childbirth, leaving an orphaned nine-year-old and two-pound baby boy. Within a few days, Elaine's husband became very, very ill with Guillain-Barre syndrome and was hospitalized and paralyzed. So she had school, she had to retain full-time employment to keep the financial oxygen on her family, care for a newly orphaned nine-year-old, her teenager, and she visited her husband and her little two-pound grandson in, who were in the same hospital but different floors. And in the two-year time period surrounding these events, she lost her father, her brother, and her sister was murdered. She felt at this time that she could be crushed under the weight of these challenges. But she learned that she was stronger and more capable than she had ever imagined. And she's undaunted. And the happy end of this story is that the little two-pounder is now in his 30s and is happily married and has two cute little daughters. Her husband did recover very well, and she and her husband just got back from serving an LDS mission in the Philippines personal strength, spiritual growth. I love this story. Uh, it's my dear friend, Angela. She was just 15 years old, living in Southern California, when her brother burst into her bedroom on a Saturday morning and said, Angela, mom and dad were in an accident. I'm not kidding. 
And by the time she and her two brothers got to the hospital, her dad had passed away, and her mother would never again be able to speak, feed herself, sit up, or care for them. So for the next few years, she and her brothers were shuffled around in a variety of living situations and circumstances, sometimes living with relatives who they didn't know. Um, eventually, when Angela was 19 years old, she was a BYU student here. And she was the sole custodian of her 11-year-old brother. And she provided for herself and her 11-year-old brother and raised him while getting her undergraduate degree. And I'll just share briefly some of the words that Angela had to, um, to share with us. And this is about her spiritual growth and her spiritual understanding. For years, I thought it was my unrighteousness that had caused my parents' accident. I had the mistaken belief that I had done something wrong that had ensued the displeasure of a wrathful God upon me. I thought that no matter how hard I tried, God was against me, and I was doomed to a constant state of misery. I believed I had been raw, wronged, robbed, mainly by God, and I had sought my whole life to do the right things and felt I was being presented with one trial after another, and I felt angry. And that was her experience for 18 years until her mother passed away. And when her mother passed away, something shifted and she began looking and seeking for exemplars of growth in the scriptures. And she began journaling. And her whole mindset changed. Um, she writes, as I looked back on my life and considered alternative paths, I realized that if I had been able to pursue my own interests, I likely would have gone down some wrong paths and may not have gained the strong testimony that I have today. As extremely hard as it was to go through the experiences that I did, I wouldn't have gained the strength, the courage, and the faith in Jesus Christ through those years of hardship. So she, she gained a, true, a truer understanding and perspective of the role of Jesus Christ and the role of her Heavenly Father in her life. There's her sweet mom. New possibilities. Who's this lady? <laughs> you know, I became a single mom, and I did not have a college degree. And I have this vision impairment, and I have to see through really strong magnifying glass. And I just, in sheer desperation, was like, what would be a practical degree? Nursing. I was just kind of hoping against hope that despite my blindness, if I could get that RN, I could find some little job somewhere doing something. Um, you know, it didn't have to be nursing or medical. I just thought, you know, nurses are respected. And having that RN after my name is going to get me a J-O-B. What I didn't expect was that it wasn't despite my blindness that I have this rewarding career. It was because of my blindness. And my blindness has created new possibilities for me to travel to other countries and meet people who are facing similar challenges and for me to uniquely equip my nursing students to be able to care for people who are experiencing vision loss, which is a lot of people. And so my blindness has turned out to create new possibilities that I couldn't have otherwise had. I'm actually an expert on blindness. <laughs> it's just because I'm blind. <laughs> okay, here's a fun one. And this is for a couple of my friends who are here visiting. Appreciation for life. Just a minute before I show you the picture, I have to get the words. And I think my friends will know who they are. But he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone Scrooge, a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner, hard and sharp as flint, which no steel had ever struck out generous fire, secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. And like others, when they have a brush with death, have a changed life and a changed view, a new appreciation for the opportunities that they have in life. And he forgave debts 
and he eased human suffering, and he uh, paid off the mortgage of his poor beleaguered clerk and uh, became a second father to Tiny Tim. Scrooge did it all and infinitely more and to Tiny Tim became a second father. There are many examples of post-traumatic growth in literature and in the scriptures, and I thought it would just be fun to put one in because a few of us really like this story. <laughs> oh boy, here's where it gets serious. This is Tedeschi and Calhoun's model of the theory of post-traumatic growth. Now, I am not, we're not gonna have time, as much as I would love to, we won't have time to go through all of this. We're gonna go through this pathway. This is the main pathway to achieving post-traumatic growth. And these are the things that I think are important for you to know as friends and family members of people who will struggle through challenging circumstances. But first, let me tell, give you a little backstory here. Post-traumatic growth is both an outcome and a process. So we started with the outcome, so you could get to know what it was, and now we're gonna go through the process. And one of the things that motivated this process was Tedeschi and Calhoun were working with combat veterans. We think of combat veterans sometimes as returning from war with physical injuries, but also and maybe especially with deep psychological wounds and uh, sometimes they're not able to function. And there's this thing called post-traumatic stress disorder. And Tedeschi and Calhoun were saying, because of the trauma that many of these soldiers have experienced horribly, this is not a disorder. It is a normal reaction to what they've experienced. It's not a disorder. Let's stop calling it a disorder and let's find where in a pathway to a positive outcome they are so we can move them through and help them and, and have them not be stuck. See, sometimes when you're a researcher, you see the world like this, like you see it in little boxes and pathways and things, and they're like, let's find them on the pathway and move them down. And so this became very, very useful in my clinical practice, working with patients because I want to foster positive outcomes. And it also became a very useful theoretical framework for me to use to guide my research and interventions that I design. Here is a little image, and I have wonderful nursing students who are amazing artists and, um, and pre-nursing students. And, uh, so we've, and we met Leah earlier, but this is a person pre-trauma. You're just comfortably minding your own business, and the trauma happens. This can be anything that disrupts your assumptive world. These are kind of big academic terms. The shattering of the assumptive world. That is, what you believed to be true about your life. Perhaps you believed you would raise that little child to adulthood. Perhaps you believed that you would be able to walk in your retirement years. Perhaps you believed um, that you had more control. So when, those, when something happens that threatens those core beliefs, it puts you in this bad place. It's not a necessarily, it's not permanent necessarily, but it's very dark and disorienting. You are cast from your comfortable living room into a new world. And as Harold Kushner said, and he is a very wise rabbi who wrote, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, which is an excellent book. Um, he said, this is the place people get to when they decide if they're willing to continue living in this world. This may not be a world I can continue to live in. This is a dangerous place to be stuck. One way you can get stuck here is by avoiding facing the trauma. You can avoid it by medicating with alcohol or with drugs or other addictions. Um, you can get stuck here by being over medicated by your care provider and just sort of stuck over medicated. Um, but this is an area on the path called intrusive rumination, where you are thinking about it, it's always with you. Whatever happened, you don't seem to see a path out. You don't seem to be able to see a way to go on. 
intrusive rumination. Now, if you can manage the painful emotions, you can get to this really important next stage, which is a type of rumination, but it's called deliberate. This is where you're going to start kind of taking the bull by the horns and saying, OK, this is my new normal. This is my new world. How can I live meaningfully in this new world? What opportunities are there for me? This is where my patients who are experiencing blindness are introduced to the many wonderful rehabilitative trainings and resources and technology that remove the barriers caused by blindness. This is also where I love to connect my patients who are new to blindness with good blind role models who can show them around this new world and that it can be beautiful. Now, I threw in this little part of the model because this is where you can help. It is so important for people who have experienced one of these shattering experiences to have someone to talk to. That box is called self-disclosure. If you can be a humble listener and just listen, sometimes when really bad things happen, people are embarrassed to talk about it because it's so bad. And if you could just say, I'm here for the long haul, and I will listen non-judgmentally, this can be very helpful and very useful. Also, this is where you could take over some of the daily tasks that that person can't do right now, like laundry and meals. Are we good at that? I think we're good at that in our um, faith, bringing in the dinners. But this is a good place to take over some of the tasks so that person can have some space to process this. The growth happens in the processing. Now, the, the second box under self-disclosure is the sociocultural environment. This is what we're doing right now. When we share stories about people who have come through difficult times and learned and grown, it helps us to have a framework in our mind to understand what that looks like. Now, when somebody is first experiencing a trauma, it may not be the time for you to say something like, there's this thing called post-traumatic growth. I'm so excited for you because a lot of people who go blind find that they're glad that they went blind. They're much stronger. And so you have to be, actually, you can do harm with this information if you're not humble and sensitive and careful with it. You know, maybe when they're a little further down the road, when there's some sunlight shining through, you could say something like, have you, I've, I've heard that some people who've experienced this have discovered that they're stronger than they thought. Have you noticed anything like that? But you'd want to be real, real careful with the timing. Mostly, the most important thing is to be a listener, a non-judgmental listener. Okay, and then um, Maddie, you're my reader. Um, she's my, re what does that say? <laughs> is it the acceptance of a changed world? This is where some acceptance comes in that you're like, okay, this is my new reality. And then this is where post-traumatic growth is realized. I love these pictures. I can't wait. It's like waiting for a surprise. <laughs> you can get up and begin to navigate this new expanded world. Just enjoy that picture for a second. Okay. So here's the model. Now here's a little part I added that I also think is important to know. Just because you've traveled down this pathway does not mean you're not going to experience distress any longer. There are still days, ask my husband, when I cry about my vision loss and I have little temper tantrums and it's still hard. There are still days where you will miss that little child that you lost or miss the little child that you didn't get to hold or et cetera, et cetera. This distress is one of the poignant and dynamic parts of the way that we grow. 
here's what we just reviewed. The value of post-traumatic growth. So why, why is it important and why do we care? Um, you'll have a new story, an expanded view of reality. You will become more resilient. Uh, post-traumatic growth is one of the pathways to resilience. We could do that another day. Uh, expanded coping repertoires. You may establish new ways to manage stress and to cope with problems. Uh, increased wisdom. Tedeschi and Calhoun did discover wisdom. They did find the path to wisdom. Compassion. This is a big one. Increased compassion and acts of service for others. Some researchers say that people who experience post-traumatic growth have, an, have created an evolutionary advantage for their society because they're now equipped to help others who are struggling with the challenge that they've already faced. This is like kind of like the work that I do with blindness and because I've faced some of these challenges, I'm uniquely equipped to help others. I'm gonna tell you a, a story from the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I have a dear friend who's a recovering alcoholic and she tells me the best stories. Sometimes I feel like I'm missing out. I should start <laughs> going to AA. I'm gonna use my son's names just to put names on these characters. Let's say Connor found himself in a deep pit with sheer steep walls. No way to clamber out. And someone comes by and looks at Connor in the pit and says, Connor, why'd you get yourself in that pit? Too bad, and they just keep going. And another person comes by and says, Connor, oh, it's so sad that you're in the pit. I'm gonna put a rope right here, okay? Bye-bye. Um, not helpful. Then, here comes Stuart. Stuart jumps into the pit with Connor. And Connor says, Stuart, now we're both in the pit. The rope's up there. And Stuart says, I've been in this pit, and I know how to get out. And I'm going to show you how to get out. So this is one of the wonderful advantages to being around somebody who's experienced post-traumatic growth. I believe that we can survive and live a meaningful life despite the unpredictable despite the unpredictable nature of our mortal experience here and despite the sometimes seeming unfairness um, that is here, I want, to, I want to close my talk with some more literature, an excerpt from a poem by Douglas Malloch from 1922. Good timber does not grow in ease. The stronger wind, the stronger trees. The further sky, the greater length, the more the storm, the more the strength. By sun and cold and rain and snow, in trees and men, good timbers grow. Thank you. I'll take some questions if anyone has any. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if the same principles apply for non traumatic experiences like a little or trials but not as traumatic as yes the one said yes there are lots of ways that we grow some of us can actually be taught <laughs> we don't have to experience things we can just learn by reading from other other sources or just learn as we go and then there is a concept called stress related growth authored by crystal park and it's not as severe. It does not involve a shattering of the assumptive world. For it to be post-traumatic growth, the hallmark, because it could be any trauma, and even traumas outside of the DSM-5 that are listed as traumas, anything that shatters what you believed 
to be true before can, can be PTG, but yes, there's lots of other types of growth. Good news. <laughs> we don't always have to do the traumatic growth. <laughs> Dr. Oh, that was so loud. Dr. Trujillo Tanner, beautiful presentation. Thank you. In your work and in your research, do you, in the pathway, is there a stage in that pathway that you think patients or individuals are more likely to get stuck? Mm -hmm. And then what can we do in helping to move them past into more growth? I might not be able to reverse this because I have all these cute animations in here, but um, it's up here at rumination intrusive and managing emotional distress. You can get stuck there. That's the dangerous dark place where you can get stuck. You can't get out. That would be kind of a description of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, you can't get down to the place where you can make meaning of this new reality. Um, so things that you can do to support someone who is stuck in that place are the self-disclosure, giving them the opportunity to talk, uh, just being there to listen. Uh, I am here, one thing that you could say that could be helpful is, I heard what happened to you and I'm very sorry. I want you to know that I'm very sorry. And you could also just make yourself a presence so they can talk and process. Another thing that can happen in that place that's not, that's on the bigger model is um, the counseling journaling, writing, self-reflection. If somebody who's in that place can get writing about it, it helps them to start cognitively processing it in a more positive way, making more meaning out of it. And the other thing that you want to avoid in that area that is any drugs or alcohol or other addictions that keep you stuck there, that just numb you out so you don't have to feel the pain. And little breaks little breaks from the pain. Like I've heard of people who have taken their buddy who lost a child out to shoot hoops. He didn't want to go, but they're like, you know what, I'm going to be at your house either way to pick you up. So you might as well, it'll be less awkward if I'm, you know, if you come with me versus me sitting in your driveway or, you know, taking a friend out, I, you know, during a difficult time, I had a great friend who just took me out for sushi. Um, you know, just getting somebody out, just a little relief from the emotional pain and eventually, and also time heals. This process doesn't happen quickly. So just knowing that holding on time will help you to get past that. I loved it too. I wondered if, uh, similar to her, but do you have success with people that are referred to you or people that come to you? I mean, I wondered how that's set up. I yeah. Well, in a therapeutic, in, in therapeutic regard, you would have both. Now, if somebody's coming to you and they're actively seeking out help, they're already getting down into that deliberate rumination. They're already seeking out resources. So that's a really good and promising sign. But if they haven't come to you and they've somehow just have no other choice or they've just landed in the middle of your lab like a cannonball, um, you can bear with them and just, and just be there and be a listener. That, that should help. Nina, you are, of course, one of my favorite people on the earth, and this was just wonderful, but I have a question. Because you have gone through this, I mean, the entire process of this, and you probably didn't even know about this when you, you know, when you were young, -er, what did you do as you were going down into the depths of despair? Um, well, was it your testimony of Jesus Christ? Was it your... your your courage, what, tell us about what it took for you to do the post-traumatic growth to get there. Okay, well, one thing that we do know is that um, there is a category up here in the model, in the full model, called person pre-trauma, and we know that people who um, have more of an extroverted personality have an easier time getting through this process of this way of post-traumatic growth because they're better at reaching out to friends and finding opportunities to talk and get answers and seeking out counseling. Um, we also know through research that people who 
are more religious, have an easier time getting from that shattering place down to recognizing some benefit and some growth from the accruing from that struggle. Because if you're religious, you already have that kind of existential framework of why am I here? What is the purpose of my life? And, and how is God going to help me? I do know that in the darkest moments that it was friends and family and the Savior Jesus Christ, the Savior Jesus Christ meets us in that dark place. Uh, Truman Madsen taught about uh, the Lord's Prayer, interpreted from Hebrew, that instead of saying, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it is, yea, though I walk through the valley of deepest darkness. And that's that intrusive rumination section. That is where the Savior meets us. He meets us in the valley of deepest darkness, and he's buoyed me up and strengthened me and helped me many ways and many times. Thank you so much for a beautiful talk. I had a question for you about um, the role of ecclesiastical leaders in helping this process. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit different than a friend or a family member, and I was just curious if you had any advice. And I know why you have that question. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tedeschi and Calhoun call it being an expert companion, but it doesn't mean you're an expert at all things trauma. It means you're an expert at humbly listening and letting the person teach you about their experience. Listening. I think I, I could put a slide that says listening, humble listening. That, that is incredibly helpful. In fact, I was just listening to a podcast by Richard Tedeschi, and he really thinks that is like the most important thing, having someone to talk to. Just listening. Is it possible in that dark area where somebody, you say that they get stuck, is it possible that that almost becomes their new normal yeah. and that actually is where they are comfortable and if that's the case how do you move them out of that new normal in a way that's healthy and at what point would eliciting services outside of family be important mm -hmm. how to help somebody who's been stuck there or stuck there for a real real long time and maybe it's become their reality and I do believe that there are some people, and we talk about people who've experienced a lot of trauma because uh, think about our uh, soldiers. They've often experienced childhood trauma before ending up in the military, and then they experience combat trauma and then multiple times. And so it's real hard, and their reality can really be a hell of sorts with very little hope that they will come out. Um, some of the soldiers, uh, Richard Tedeschi now runs a place called Boulder Creek uh, Retreat in the mountains of North Carolina, and it's for people with severe, severe trauma, combat soldiers and first responders in particular. And a lot of them have never heard stories of post-traumatic growth, of people coming through very difficult circumstances and coming through the other side. So, Making those stories more widely known in our sociocultural environment is helpful. Giving them an environment to talk, putting them, and this is a big one for my patients who are experiencing blindness, um, putting them in environments where they're around other people who have experienced those same challenges and who are doing well. And having them be in those peer groups, it could be a support group, it could be a um, consumer organization. For example, with blindness, there's two consumer organizations in our state, the National Federation of the Blind of Utah and the Utah Council of the Blind, and they both have activities and annual conferences, and this is where you meet all the cool blind people. So I get my newly blind people to go to those conferences and be around other people who are doing it successfully. And then one of the, one of the things, the little glimmers of hope that we have in our faith, and, and this isn't necessarily like a, a religious lecture, but we have to, all things work together here. Um, we also know that the spirit world is a place of repentance, forgiveness, hope, healing, teaching. We're not just floating around like cotton balls in spirit world. We're, 
we're working and striving and growing there still too. And sometimes I think for some people with very, very deep wounds, that healing is going to happen on the other side of this painful mortal experience. I don't know if this very possibly could be an erroneous observation, but as your mother, I watched you as you were losing your sight, pardon me, um, pursue things that you could still do while you were blind. When you went to New York and became a dancer, with a very well-known, popular dance group. And you knew that you could do that professionally, excellently, and famously if you chose. And then you went to California and studied with Alexander Rakoff and became an incredible violinist and knew that you could still be an incredible, well-known international violinist. And your blindness would not stop you. Both those circumstances, you exhausted those avenues and knew that neither of those were to be your life path. But you didn't stay just sitting blind. You pursued things that the blindness would not interfere with. And it eventually led you to your life's pursuit and career. So even pursuing things that your trauma can't interfere with to begin with and realizing you can still do hard things mm -hmm. is part of the journey. Like read. Reading is hard. <laughs> you can see why I, I love my mother. <laughs> I have a wonderful mother. And I just, that made me think of two things. Because one of the things that my mother and father did that helped me was they exposed me to stories of post-traumatic growth. I had little books as a child that told the story of John Washington Carver, George Washington Carver, the scientist, who was basically a homeless child taken in by a family uh, of Helen Keller, who's deaf, blind, and living wild and feral, and J.C. Penney, and uh, just stories, uh, Walt Disney, stories of great overcoming, rough start, great finish, and you internalize those stories, um, and they give you strength. So share those stories of overcoming with your little children in your lives. It will, it will help them. If there are no more questions, that means I did a really good job. <laughs> one, one last from Kester. Thanks, Karina, for including me in your, your presentation. Uh, you got me thinking a lot in, about inclusion and blindness. And, and I've heard a few people questions about being in that deep hold. Mm -hmm. I think for me, I find myself in that deep hole because the people around me that don't understand my blindness or don't understand my disability, that's the one that keeps me in my hole, I think. It's the people that I hang out with the blind community, I am comfortable. I am among people that understand who I am. But then I go out in the world, I, I, um, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm teasing people, I'm wearing my purple heart today. Yesterday I, I stepped off a curb and I ended up banging my head on the pavement so I got a bruise on my chin. And I was thinking, how did I make that mistake? You know, that's an easy mistake that could have been avoided. And I was around a lot of people that are sighted and all of them wanted to help me. Sometimes that help doesn't always help me because I need to navigate it myself. And so I think the energy of the people that didn't understand what I'm doing 
made me make that mistake. So I, I thought that was interesting. I was trying to reflect how this happened all week yeah, or yes, since yesterday. But thanks for including me. And um, I guess my other question is culturally, I want to, I think we've talked about this. How do we explore this concept culturally? Because I think culturally it's not quite understood, maybe. I don't know how the framework uh, fits on Navajo, and I kind of wondered how it would fit into that culture because yeah. we're so. I mean, our mindset, I guess, is different. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and that might be some really good and important work for you to do in your PhD, Kester, <laughs> to explore the cultural implications of this model because this is framed from a, you know, a, it was created in the USA from people who had PhDs. And so there may be other, there certainly undoubtedly are other pathways. And, and one of the things that you touched on is that's a sociocultural uh, aspect of this, and there always needs to be more research there and uh, expanded views for people of different races and different cultures, but also the sociocultural expectations of people with disabilities, I think is what you were talking on. Uh, there's nothing worse than being trapped in the prison of low expectations, so that's another thing that we can do for each other is believe in each other. I have dear friends here who've always believed in me, and having someone who believes in you and believes that you can be successful and you can be independent. Will, will manifest in truth. So thank you all. Thanks very much.